I first visited uh, Bangladesh back in 2009. And, um, you know, at that stage, I'd been involved with um, Fred Hyde um, and, and the organisation for over a decade. And I'd always promised myself one thing, that I would never go to Bangladesh. Uh, because, you know, one of the things that I remember growing up on was a diet of foreign news. And whenever Bangladesh came up, it was always to talk about um, you know, massive ferry accidents and, you know, mass drownings um, on these giant rivers in Bangladesh. And I developed some sort of mental picture that I promised myself I'd never see in the reality. And, um, you know, the, the day came um, at a certain point when um, I had a lot of spare time uh, due to circumstances of my own making. And I decided, look, I couldn't put it off any longer if I wanted to continue to be actively involved with the organisation. And, you know, by one um, era and another, I found myself on board one of these nightmare ships um, heading south towards an island that I knew was associated um, with one of the great environmental catastrophes in history, the Bola cyclone, which happened in 1970 and is closely related to the um, origins of Bangladesh as a nation. And the, at that particular event, the Bola cyclone, there were you know, a giant tidal wave had virtually swept the southern part of the island clean of all human life and most of the cattle and other animals as well into the bargain. And so, you know, I found myself in 2009 stepping down the gangplank to a strange new world. I'd like to tell you that the um, that the trip went uneventfully, but I'm afraid that uh, was not the case. We ended up getting... Um, uh, grounded on a sandbank and uh, we went hungry. Eventually I ate some of the ship food and um, ended up in another nightmare, Bangladeshi hospital. Now on the screen there, you can see um, uh, that the island of Bangladesh and um, sorry, the island of Bola, which is the largest um, uh, of the Bangladeshi uh, Delta Islands by far, uh, but not necessarily the oldest because the way the great rivers work in this region um, is that they're, they're continually at work on the clay of these islands uh, and there's erosion from the Tertulia to the west and the Magna to the right on a scale that's very hard for us to conceive. So, you know, um, the island of Bola shifts south into the Bay of Bengal at around 70 metres of uh, 70 metres every year, um, which means a huge amount of people are, are displaced in that process. And just a few moments ago, you saw a picture of me standing on the edge and about 500 metres behind me, as I was pretending to be a, you know, a journalist, um, was the site of one of our original schools. Um, and that school, Five Doors, was sponsored by um, donors who are still with us today. Now, the Five Doors School um, was eventually um, swamped by, by the river, which is the Magna, and we shifted it um, almost in its entirety to a spot closer and drier, uh, closer to the village of Five Doors, which became quite a thriving fishing village in the time that we've been um, providing education in this very, very uh, poor district. And you can see the village here um, gradually being dismantled as the river heads um, inland. And um, you know, the parts of the industry it still remain, obviously shipbuilding is a big, big factor in this region. And, um, and you know, the ice factories on the other side of the road had already gone. And step by step, you know, these, um, these little villages disappear and the poorest people tend to have the waterfront land here, uh, not the rich, um, because these places are extremely exposed to high tide, wind, um, and you know, when cyclones come, cyclones, and here you can see a generator being shifted by hand, a uh, fairly high value item being shifted uh, onto the bund where it will be taken away to its new home. Everything is pretty primitive and pretty manual still in Bangladesh. And you can see the aftermath of um, one of the recent cyclones, Amphan, uh, which amazingly enough left our school, Five Doors, which you're about to see, completely exposed, but left it miraculously intact. 
the school is literally, literally clinging onto the edge of the dike. You know, these islands, um, these mud dikes surround the entire island. So effectively, you look at these islands and they're really like a, a flat bowl of clay with a very narrow little lip around it, which provides some degree of perfect protection from these great rivers. And here we're about to go and visit the site of a new potential school on a island named after the Prime Minister, Hasina, uh, Sheikh Hasina. And um, these are islands that have been inhabited for decades, but still don't have a single school, let alone a, a shop or any kind of motorised transport. The boat that we're on does have a, um, a petrol motor, um, but we're about to get very muddy indeed, stepping onto what would be generous to call dry land. Um, and, you know, this is a trip that we make regularly and our inspectors make regularly to visit our variety of, of schools, um, you know, as part of the auditing process to ensure that the teachers are teaching properly and that the, the children are present and the buildings are kept maintained and all the other kinds of work that are involved with running a charity on the scale that we have. And you know, you're about to see an old man here, the one to the left of screen, make an attempt to step <laughs> to step on, on back to his home island. And you know, there's no very little consideration made for young and old, for weak and strong. And he hesitates and eventually he <laughs> takes the plunge and gets himself onto dry land. But you know, you see pregnant women, babies, uh, even cattle making this perilous journey um, across the waves that, you know, the waves on these rivers are fairly stable, you know, like they might be four or five foot um, in rough weather. But when it's cyclonic, um, people receive warnings by mobile phone and radio and all the boats, which are fairly flat bottom boats and fairly unstable, come into port as much as possible. But every storm lives are lost. There he goes. This is his home. This is an island that has no, um, you know, no uh, paved roads, um, you know, that does have motorbikes, which are used to get around, but it's a very, very primitive conditions. And, you know, this scene shows the degree of determination that our children show in getting to school. This is not a particularly wet day, and this is not a particularly difficult road. You'll see some more in, in a minute. But these kids are traveling up to two or three kilometers uh, through this kind of condition. Two or three kilometers in Australia is no big deal, but in these conditions with barefoot, carrying your books, um, in this sort of weather, steaming hot, unbelievably hot by Australian standards, almost for me unbearably hot as a, you know, coming from Dutch heritage. And my interpreter asks the girl at this point, how high does the water come to in high tide, which is a regular occurrence, high tide? The sea presses the river water up um, so that it rises on a daily basis at certain times of year to the point where the girl indicates on her leg, comes up almost to waist height, and they wade through that to get to these schools that you know Fred and the team that came after him have built. And you can see the kids pushing on some of them with umbrellas, and most of them have school bags made out of a little bit of plastic. Um, that's the limit of their, um, you know, that's the limit of their um, luxury in terms of school life. And it gets very slippery. The mud in the schools becomes so slippery, the teachers lean out to assist the kids to get up. And we, we've built stairs at most of our schools, but um, you can see the degree to which the kids are packed in, you can see the degree to which the schools are extremely basic. Um, certainly, you can never argue that um, the organisation wastes any donor money in delivering the maximum amount of education uh, for the maximum amount of, of children for the minimum price. And where this gentleman is, is walking um, is one of the hometowns or colonies um, of a, um, uh, of the kids who live in the who come to these schools, they live in places such as um, you can see with this particular um, uh, picture of the of the colony. Um, and these colonies 
uh, back, back, to, back to back colonies. The people live there with their chickens and, and ducks in the houses, uh, no electricity. And they drink water from the pond that you can see over there. Now, our schools do have um, uh, deep water wells, which provide safe arsenic free water. But in this particular area, those wells are not working and the people are forced to drink from these dire ponds, extremely, it's a really devil and deep blue sea situation. And you can see the effect, arsenic poisoning, which is considered by World Health Organization, one of the great mass poisonings in history, is something that is still going on in Bangladesh. Um, all our schools have got um, deep wells that go, that are tested and go um, to a level below the level at which the heavy metals of arsenic um, are still embedded in the, in the soil. Um, but, you know, it leaves an impact, both a social and health impact on the people that are poisoned. It's really a mark of poverty, this kind of um, uh, major skin lesions that you can see here. Um, it's, it's something that is very uh, confronting. But, you know, step back and the island is green and beautiful particularly for someone who comes from a farm background in Australia, like myself, um, just the sight of the green grass and the endless rain was, to be honest, it's very hard to repress the joy, even though I was fearful of those great rivers and fearful of drowning in Bangladesh. <laughs> I uh, couldn't help but feeling a kind of shining light inside me when I saw the, you know, the beautiful lush countryside and the um, rich soil now, just looking ahead in what we're planning to do with the charity in, in coming years, I just want to have a, a few words about that. In the short term, we've got the COVID crisis, of course, and we've addressed that in a number of ways by distributing, you know, soap to the children, you know, hand washing and, you know, basic hygiene is not really that common um, in places of, of such great poverty. Um, we've also asked our, our teachers to go home, stay home, the schools are shut, and we're continuing to pay um, we continue to pay our staff, which means that, you know, 180 odd families, because each teacher represents an extended family, are able to feed their family and look after themselves and look after their extended community. Um, you know, in addition, um, you know, we are looking at um, producing a, uh, a curriculum that is accelerated. Um, so that when the schools do reopen, once the government makes a decision to reopen, um, that we will be in a position um, to get our kids optimally prepared for the exams with the particularly critical year five exam coming up, which is the entrance year five, which is really the sixth year. I won't bother explaining that. The sixth year is the preparation for high school. Uh, and kids who go on to high school are very much in the minority in Bangladesh. Um, the majority finish, particularly boys finish at, um, at primary school and do not go on. But um, we want to prepare our kids for that moment when the schools do, do reopen and we're in a position to um, give them the best start they can to their high schools. And we are planning to build, you know, better wells and better toilets. Um, we've got them at some of our schools, but want to have them at all of our schools. And we'll be doing that in the next few months. You know, building New schools is something that we always have demand for from donors. And we also want to look at things like building better schools. So, you know, making sure that each of our schools, which currently still don't have all of them concrete floors, making sure that they've got, you know, sealed floors, which make them a lot more pleasant, particularly during the monsoon. And we are also looking at doing things like, you know, developing um, further education programs. Uh, it, it's something that we've really looked at over the years and we keep getting donor interest and support for that. Building a high school is the other option um, that um, we want to cons consider because giving the kids something to aim for. In, in local areas, you know, considering how difficult it is to commute for kids to high school, it's not a matter of just jumping on a bus and heading down the road to the local high school. Um, even a distance of a few kilometres is um, an ambitious distance and you saw the conditions in which the kids are uh, walking. And then finally, you know, 
looking at providing healthcare services for um, our kids, uh, particularly the ones that have, have disabilities or major illnesses. There are no real medical services in this region and we need to do more to make sure that there's something um, that they have the capacity to go to school, that they have the capacity to thrive. Um, and that's something that we've been actively doing with a small number of high risk at need um, kids within our school system. But, you know, within the limits of um, our limited budget, because we're a very large charity in terms of scale, we've got 10,000 kids full time, but we're a small charity in terms of budget. And now, finally, I just wanted for the sake of my committee members to show a moment when I ambitiously strode into the monsoon and it ended up collapsing into the water, um, captured on film for posterity. That that goes out just to um, that goes out to my committee members, and but it gives you a scale, it gives you a sense of the degree of difficulty you can experience um, in travelling around in Bangladesh. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Paddy O'Leary, um, who I've worked with um, on the ground and who spent many many months working independently uh, in Bangladesh to build our schools over there and uh, kindergartens and wells and whatnot. Paddy. Paddy. Sorry, technically I'm a little bit short. Um, <laughs> okay. okay, what's with that beer? Look, uh, my name's Paddy, and obviously I'm the building uh, supervisor, or uh, for want of a better name, uh, for COID uh, or Fred Hyde Schools. Um, and I've been travelling there and staying there for uh, two to three months uh, over the last few years to uh, uh, complete whatever projects uh, are deemed uh, um, or planned for that uh, year by the committee. Um, now, that can be repair, simple repairs, new tube wells, uh, um, upgrading a school um, or, or building new schools. Uh, now, when I say upgrade, most of our schools are simple buildings, as you, as you can see by the videos, and we, um, uh, um, but with mud floors, but we're about halfway through to giving them all uh, concrete floors and uh, uh, bricked up to window level, which creates a uh, a much improvement environment within the school. It, it's safer and um, uh, greatly enjoyed by the staff and, and the students uh, as it uh, is uh, dry during the wet season as well. Okay, so uh, basically, you know, the process of building the school, we are uh, um, either approached by a community to, to request a school uh, or, or perhaps we are directed to a community that may need one. So then follows consultation with schools, uh, with communities to um, uh, decide where they want a school um, and uh, what they would uh, contribute to the building process, as well as uh, um, uh, ensuring that uh, there are enough uh, uh, children there, you know. So once we've investigated and we saw there's a school and we have permission from the government, etc., uh, then we go ahead and uh, and build a school. But obviously, we're always trying to have that uh, community on side, but uh, which uh, uh, makes it a lot easier for um, in the future as the school develops. Uh, if you have good relations with the community. Um, now, the, the land is donated generally uh, by the uh, people in the community, which is a big sacrifice in Bangladesh as uh, uh, it's very expensive land, even by Australian standards in Bangladesh. Um, uh, so once that land's donated, we put it into the uh, uh, name of the Bangladesh uh, uh, Department of Education. Now, that signifies that we're there to cooperate with the Bangladesh government uh, and, you know, we're not just building some sort of uh, educational empire. Also, with the community uh, contributing land and, and some labour, uh, it gives them a sense of ownership of the project. Um, okay, so once the site's selected, we uh, 
then have to purchase materials. Now, we purchase all our materials uh, locally within the local markets. Now, this gives a boost. Uh, you know, our money is spent there, so we are quite uh, welcome and, and also very well known within these communities uh, or these marketplaces. Um, and it's a bit of a string to the bow of uh, any of the merchants who uh, uh, succeed in getting our business. Um, uh, it also means uh, the, uh, the dollar that is donated here in Australia, we get full value by being there um, and supervising the purchase of all materials. Um, now, once that's purchased, we have to get that to site. Yeah, and as you can see there, sometimes we've even got to buy the trees to get cut up. But uh, uh, Getting uh, to site sometimes is a bit of a logistic challenge, as this, as Oliver said, is an extremely wet um, environment. Uh, even in the dry season, there's some schools you've still got to walk into. Um, uh, so we're using everything from rickshaws to uh, tractors and trailers, uh, uh, as you can see here, boats. Um, uh, uh, so it's very labour intensive, uh, it can be slow, can be a bit frustrating, but uh, uh, to give you an idea, uh, when we built the school on Kutchwa Island, which you were looking at before, um, uh, I think we had to take 12,000 bricks there. Now those bricks were handled individually five times before the bricklayer touched them. You know, by going from the brickworks to the boat, onto the boat, off the boat, onto the, another truck and then to the site. Uh, so it can be a bit of a process, but uh, these things, are, you know, the Bangladeshis are not unused to this. So they usually, you know, once the task is set, they're into it. Uh, and the community are there to help. Um, Timber is uh, ordered to uh, to length because, you know, timber is scarce there. It's not uh, uh, the sort of quality we would expect here in Australia. But uh, uh, so when we're loading the timber, we've got to measure every length and uh, count every piece so that when we get to a site, everything is there. Because uh, as with uh, Kachua Island, it's a, you know, 40 minute, 80 um, hour to, to get to the school by boat. And, Basically, to go back even for a, uh, a half a kilo of nails is a day trip. Um, uh, so, uh, once everything's on site, we um, and the builders uh, are then there, and uh, the site's pegged out and uh, building start. Now, when we're building, usually the the builders, the carpenters, and the um, uh, masons that do the brickwork and the concrete floors now, uh, they all live on site. So, uh, uh, and then uh, either myself or, or other members of the staff, we travel there every day. And that's to uh, um, ensure that they're building to what's required and uh, to our standard. Uh, and although they're very simple, our schools, uh, construction, they, uh, they have stood the test of time in terms of, um, uh, you know, they rust away and rot away and we're always fixing some of them. But um, uh, there's been many cyclones since Fred built the first school and uh, uh, we haven't lost a roof. There was a very serious cyclone a couple of months ago and uh, while we had some... Uh, um, uh, loose sheets of iron. We actually only had one school that lost a sheet of iron. So uh, that's testament probably to uh, Fred's design, which was really copied off uh, the local building um, uh, uh, traditions there. Uh, so we're lucky in that regard. Um, and they're quite cost effective. Um, Obviously, the bigger thing with the, with the school is getting it up out of the water, uh, which is difficult because the water doesn't always right. You know, you build a school and go, well, the water comes this high according to the community, but maybe next year it goes a foot higher. Uh, so there are places where we have to build that mud up, you know, three and four feet. And that's typically how they build in uh, Bangladesh. You, you know, you dig a hole and make a mound and then uh, build on top of it. And the, the, the hole becomes a pond, which they, you know, use everything from bathing uh, to um, 
uh, washing to uh, 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 raising fishing. Um, so I guess that's uh, um, uh, basically describes the, um, uh, the building process. You can see there on your screen now, there was uh, uh, putting down a tube well which goes down uh, 900 feet. They, they, it's all wound down by hand. They dig the hole uh, by pipe. Uh, and then uh, a, uh, you know, another piece of pipe is put on top and it's wound down in the ground. They go down 900 feet to fresh water. And then a hand pump's put on top. Uh, we build a platform around the um, hand pump and uh, you have fresh water, which is not only for the school, but once you have a, 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 a um, tube well there, everybody in the community comes and uses it, uh, you know, uh, if they don't have their own tube well or if there's not another one available. Um, uh, you can see on the screen there, that's the project that uh, Tony Kent touched on and uh, uh, talking of uh, cementing that um, second floor up there, you know, I think we had 39 labourers there for the day, uh, which was a fairly big project, um, uh, which um, certainly stretched my skills beyond my ability, but um, uh, it's been a great success and uh, uh, hopefully we can, um, uh, in the future, that uh, uh, it's a success we have planned for that building. Now, uh, there's some views there of children working. Everything is labour intensive and um, uh, right down to children you see working there, young boys. You know, I was at a brickwork once and these two boys that were probably 10 or 12 years old, you know, they were making the bricks in a little mud mould and they were making 12 bricks a minute. And uh, uh, I went back uh, about half an hour later and they were still making 12 a minute. You know, the brickworks are, are very dusty, ordinary places and in, uh, intensive uh, uh, manual labour. Um, so... Uh, most of the people there are day labourers. You know, the whole economy is based on uh, digging mud and, um, uh, you know, whether it be roads or, or, or levee banks. And uh, uh, But uh, there is time for play there. They love their football, uh, soccer as we call it here, and, uh, of course, they're cricket mad, you know, and they know more. <laughs> they, uh, they know the names of even all the Australian cricketers. Yeah, but you can see these are the sort of fields they play their soccer on. It's um, yeah, to be challenging. Uh, 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 I couldn't see too many of our Australian schools um, uh, suffering that sort of standard, but... Uh, they do their best um, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly some of their local cricket games are very um, uh, well attended and uh, competitive. We also have, uh, uh, you know, you see on a Friday afternoon after midday prayers, you know, like lots and lots of groups of children and young people playing cricket. Okay, thank you very much for uh, listening to me tonight. And um, look, uh, thanks, Paddy. I, I was going to, Paddy was at this stage going to introduce um, Pratima, um, but as Tony mentioned earlier, um, Pratima um, is unavailable due to the death of her mum, uh, and her mum's in Mauritius. Um, and look, I'm going to play a video that I prepared for the background for, for Pratima, and I know roughly what she was going to say. And one of the things that I can remember striking me um, uh, from, from her experience. So she spent roughly a month in Bangladesh. And I can remember her saying that it reminded her so much of growing up in Mauritius in the village, except that was, you know, 30 years ago. And except that even though she didn't have running water in the house and they all lived in two rooms or something, the poverty that she experienced in Bangladesh still completely shocked her. So Pratima was um, in Bangladesh to do her PhD. And her PhD is on, you know, rural and remote health. And, you know, I happen to be her PhD supervisor, which is how I got to know Pradama. And, you know, she was a wonderful person to travel around and see Bangladesh through someone else's eyes for the first time. This is Pradama on the back of a bike. You know, um, she certainly had gumption and um, just went for it and ate what we ate and did what we did, slept where we all slept and, um, you know, showed really great spirit 
in attacking the difficult countryside. And as we traveled around, one of the things that really began to emerge as a theme for her was, you know, the close presence of water, which, you know, I'd talked about in a rather paranoid way a little bit earlier, but Pranima saw that the schools offer, offer basically little bits of island of dryness. In the, and Patty built, you know, Patty helped supervise building of this school. And it, I remember visiting it after he built and feeling after trudging through the mud, this utter sense of relief when you got to the schools and you had at least one place where you could feel safe, where you could feel dry and where you could feel above the water. And as we traveled around, um, you know, she crossed little bridges like this, little charcos they're called. Uh, and she was petrified of drowning because she can't swim, as indeed a lot of Bangladeshis cannot swim or not swim very effectively. And again and again, we found cases at schools in this particular year more than other years where we discovered someone's child had fallen into the river and drowned. Or that school that you just saw previously, this one here, a child had run out of the school in a great hurry and slipped and fallen in the water and almost drowned. And, you know, we'd had three deaths that year, uh, but we also had um, a number of near drownings. And this really touched Pradhaman so that she, um, before she left, she committed with her family to actually, um, you know, paying for um, filling that pond that you saw there and helping contribute towards the building of um, a bridge. I actually wanted to turn the volume up um, on this video because as you get closer to the school, so I will turn the volume up and apologize for the noise. This is still a fair way from the school. And even on this video, you can hear the kids screaming in the background. So one of, the, one of you asked about the, um, how to separate classes inside um, these schools. And it is extraordinarily difficult inside a school when you've got three or four grades operating at once. Yes, they've got different teachers and yes, they're separated from each other, but they're in this one metal box. Um, and it is extraordinarily difficult to, it becomes a screaming match between the different teachers, to be honest, and the children. Uh, it becomes almost a competition who, to, who, who can be louder than everybody else. Um, and the, the final thing I wanted to quickly show you, and this is sort of the end of the, the videos, and we'll next be talking um, with Bohan. Um, the final thing I want to show you was the bridge that Pradama built, effectively, with, with her family money. So that, that rickety charco that you saw was replaced by a proper bridge that we designed so that motorbikes couldn't drive across it because motorbikes very quickly ruin things. But there's a handrail, child level handrail on both sides, child friendly handrail, so that the children can cross over safely even in very wet weather without the danger of drowning. And this particular bridge was built at the site of one of the drownings. Um, so it's a very significant bridge um, and one that we, you know, obviously thank Pradhama and her family for. Um, and the other thing that Pradhama contributed, she saw the power of the internet there. And, you know, she wanted to be connected um, to her family while we were there. So she actually paid for the connection of um, a cable internet to our office there. Um, would cost a fortune in Australia to have a specific cable taken to your office. But over there, um, everything's cheap, including life. Um, and I think the cost of it was around $400 to get, um, to get cable internet. And every month it costs us next to nothing now to have proper quality internet, which allows us to have Zoom sessions with Bangladesh. So as I promised, um, we're on to our final speaker now, which is Bohan, um, uh, who is one of two expatriate um, Bangladeshis on our committee, something of which I think as a charity I'm particularly proud of, to have the involvement of Bangladeshi community members here in Australia in this charity is extremely useful to the charity. But it's also a little bit um, like it's extremely useful to me as chair of the charity, but it's also um, a credit to the charity, I think. So, Bohan, over to you if you want to unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. 
Shubetta, it's greetings in Bangla. So welcome. So after all the very glossy videos and what you have seen, I'm a bit with the dry stuff. Um, I would start with my journey with Fred Hyde Schools, which was 11 years back, asking a lot of questions to Tony Kent about transparency, administration fees, accountability, those sort of stuff. And poor Tony, he couldn't answer some of my questions and um, he used to, he had to speak to Fred and come back to me later on. And today I take this opportunity to take you through our system and processes to show you in brief how we ensure transparency and accountability and make the dollars of the donors work harder. So firstly, as you can see from the chart uh, or the diagram that the Fred Hyde School Committee is in absolute control. We have a school coordinator in Dhaka. We have six office staff, almost 166 teachers, if I'm not wrong. We have a operations subcommittee. And we also have a uh, recruitment subcommittee, uh, apart from the constructions which Paddy previously covered and had the uh, school uh, inspectors. So firstly, uh, I would like to speak about our bank accounts. We actually have a number of bank accounts in Bangladesh. And one of those bank accounts are the main bank accounts to which the staff have access. And this bank account actually has um, sufficient amount of money for day-to-day -day expenses or any ad hoc expenses. Any banking instructions or any banking transactions um, are done through the instructions from the appropriate person from the Australian uh, committee and the communication is sent directly to the bank and they actually act on that. And this is also a fantastic way how we minimize the risk. Payroll is another area which is done by Sue Walpole of our committee. And uh, through the payroll, uh, we pay all our staff and teachers directly into the bank account. Now, to give you a little bit of context why I'm speaking of the payroll, uh, there are some organizations over there because most of the accounting there is done on a cash basis. And what happens is most of the people don't have a bank account because they live in very remote areas. However, we have requested all our staff and teachers to have a bank account so that the salary can be paid directly into their account because with some of the organizations, sometimes there are issues with kickbacks. In other words, the office staff may take some money out of the salary and hand over the rest to uh, the employees. So although, um, so this is another way we actually have uh, minimized risk um, from this end. In terms of the operations subcommittee, uh, it's headed by Iqbal, one of our members of Bangladeshi origin, myself and the chair, Olaf. And we generally make day-to-day -day decisions and with any complex issues, we refer it back to the committee. With the recruitment committee, the main uh, the responsibility is to recruit staff or teachers in Bangladesh. Now, this is a very important area and I would explain why. We do the recruitment when one of our staff, at least one of our staff is in Bangladesh and the candidates have to have a written exam. And once they have passed the written exam, they have to go through a viva or oral exam. And at that point in time, we also have other committee members from Australia who 
log in through Zoom and the interviews are conducted. The reason it's very important that we have put our control even on the recruitment is there is a lot of poverty in that area. There might also be political interference and sometimes with jobs, there are exchange of bribes and it may cost between Australian $1,700 to $3,300. And by having an absolute control on this process, we not only ensure that we have the best candidates, good quality teachers, but simultaneously it ensures that our students receives better education. I can say we are probably one of the very few in that area, if not the only one, uh, where any job is offered completely based on merit. In terms of the communications, um, the way it works is any um, instructions that we send to Bangladesh can go through the coordinator in Dhaka or it can directly go to the office staff depending on the urgency. Um, however, what we have done is uh, we have a very open communication channel. We have 56 schools and 56 localities or 56 communities. Anyone from there, the teachers, the students, their parents, or even local members of the community can reach any one of us in Australia, especially my and Iqbal's phone numbers are over there. Anyone can access us if they want to avoid the office, if they want to pass confidential information. They can even um, lodge complaints through Facebook. And on a number of occasions, it has happened that we have received complaints even before the office has received that. And we have uh, taken actions uh, accordingly. The other thing I wanted to uh, say briefly is if we receive any sort of complaints from Bangladesh about any issue, it's investigated by the DACA uh, coordinator. It's investigated by myself. Iqbal. And these are all three separate investigations. And at the end, we come together and um, we make a decision. Now, in terms of our ins inspectors, now I would go to the next slide. Uh, we, I believe, are the only school where we have inspectors who can go to a school at any time during the school hours. And it may be, they might even visit a school twice a day. Um, and especially during the wet season when things get really difficult, as you can see from that picture. Um, and at other times as well, we also do phone monitoring. In other words, uh, the inspectors may call a school headmaster or a teacher at a school, and they may ask to pass mobile phones to the other teachers. And through that, we also monitor whether the teachers are present or not, and whether things are going, um, whether everything is going appropriately in that school in terms of the uh, timing schedules, whether they have come on time. Finally, um, in terms of our school uh, students, um, they, we, when they actually go to high schools, what we have found out is they are within the top 20 students in every single school. And that's because of the uh, quality of the education that Fred Hyde um, schools provide. And um, with that, um, I would like to thank you all uh, for listening to me and uh, Tony, um, I would like to hand over to you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Warham. And I'll watch this video. This is lovely. How to be the <laughs> of the
you can see, you can look around. <laughs> These are just kids. They're kids just like any kids. They like fun. They need a home. They need love. They need a school and they need a future. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to help. So with that, thank you to Borhan, Olav and Paddy. And we've got a view of lots of people here tonight. Isn't that fantastic? Um, so there were some really great insights there. So thank you guys. Everyone is welcome to stay for the questions. Um, and uh, if you prefer to talk to any of the speakers afterwards, we're actually going to put up our mobile phone numbers. Um, it's all pretty open here, so you can ring who you want after the session and have a talk. We're more than pleased to operate in an open way. No problem at all. But for now, let me just introduce some of the questions here. Um, so those are the numbers of the people you, you're hearing from tonight. Um, some of the questions. Let me, um, and I think that's being copied into the chat in case you need it. Some of the questions. I've got um, one for Paddy first off, maybe. Uh, tell us about the water quality there and how much is like fresh water versus salty water uh, and, and arsenic water versus clean water. Tell us a little bit about the water there. Uh, well, generally speaking, uh, the tube well water is, is good. W when you put down a tube well, uh, the water does have to be tested. So uh, uh, the government, uh, the testers then declare if that water is uh, safe for drinking or not. Um, uh, if the arsenic is too, uh, uh, too strong, uh, they paint a purple ring around the uh, tube well and everybody knows that that's not drinking water. But, you know, any of the other water, uh, you know, the, uh, in ponds or the rivers, yeah, I, I wouldn't like to have a stomach full of it. I don't think I'd be very well a couple of days later uh, or sooner. Um, uh, obviously, there is a, a plentiful supply there of bottled water, which I use when I'm there. Although I have drank uh, the well water. Uh, the tube well water, and uh, you know, it's not unlike the tube well, wa the well water I've drank here in Australia. Um, in fact, uh, I've drank worse in Australia. Um, does yeah. that suffice? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, maybe one for Olaf now. Uh, what are the predictions in 50 years or so, given climate change and the inundation of the low-lying areas here? What, what are the predictions for Boulder Island? Uh, look, I think that when you're in a place like um, uh, Boulder Island, you realise that all this talk about the sea levels rising by two, mil two millimetres a year or something doesn't mean a lot in Australia. Uh, but two millimetres, you know, adds up. So in the last um, hundred years, the, the sea levels in that region have risen by about 15 centimetres. Now that means whole islands have, have become um, unlivable because it means 15 centimetres is the base level. Um, you know, it depends on which predictions we, we believe, but if it rises by another 15 centimetres, and frankly, that's on the very bottom scale of, um, of um, expectations, it will have very serious implications, but not just for Bola. People think that when you're in Dhaka, you're a long way from trouble, and you are, you're two or three, kilo, two or three hundred kilometers away from the coast, but you're only about two meters above sea level. So some of the Kiribati style uh, predictions suddenly become extremely relevant, even as far as Dhaka. And you know, their problems are our problems, because if, something goes wrong in terms of Bangladesh. You've got 160, 170 million people who are suddenly going to be pushing north to get away from the water. And they'll be pushing into trouble, you know. Um, that, so, you know, wherever th the problems of countries like Bangladesh, heavily populated and very close to the sea, are very big problems for all of us because that's going to create a lot of refugees if it goes wrong. And, you know, that depends upon which predictions or, or projections you believe, Tony. Mm. 
No, Tony, yes, just on that, I think a recent uh, figure I've seen was uh, somewhere near a metre, uh, half a metre to a metre rise would displace 42 million Bangladeshis. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, and, and look, I, I'd add from my end that the issue of, that this relates to the issue of erosion of the island by the mighty rivers there. And the erosion, of course, because the water is coming from the north, the erosion is heavy at the north end of the island and the south end of the island actually builds up. Um, so guess what? Our schools are towards the south end of the island. So the river erosion is typically not an issue for us. There's the odd exception that I'll have a show, but uh, normally not an issue for us. But the sea rise could be, depending on how far it goes. And Tony, um, you know, one of the points in my nervousness that I forgot to make tonight is that, you know, where we build our schools is always on the margins, you know, where the government doesn't build its schools. The government tends to build schools close to paved roads, you know, areas where it's safe from the, the sea and from river incursion. They don't tend to build them on the edges. And we literally build our schools around the edges of society, which is where the poorest people live. They're sort of clinging to these dikes that are built around there. That's where the houses cling to, and that's where we build our schools. Um, so inevitably, we find ourselves, as with the Five Doors School, having to move the school because it's really precarious country. And these people are technically all squatters. Um, they're all living on public land uh, because their own land has been destroyed by the rivers. Mm -hmm. It's quite a place. Uh, I mean, to give you an idea of the background to this, this was originally started by Fred Hyde um, 30 years ago. He had been traveling after retirement for three months around India and Bangladesh. And he reached Boulder Island and he, he looked around and he said, well, on a scale of poverty, this place wins the gold award. It is the poorest place I've visited. And he had had three months on the ground at that stage. So um, that was how we began to say, well, if there's a need, this is where it's greatest. And that tradition of going to where the need is greatest has fed through into what we're doing now, bringing schools to the really remote areas around Boulder Island and finding a way to bring education to the remaining children. Next question I think would be for Borhan. Um, it says, having the government involved, and uh, we believe you put the land in the Department of Education name, how much focus is placed on corruption, and is that a concern by the committee? Borhan, would you like to talk a little bit about, um, you're the man on, on battling corruption. Okay, so, um, Oliver, you can add later on, should you wish. Uh, my understanding is that uh, to build a school, we have to write the land in the name of the government. Uh, that's a requirement. And in terms of the corruption, yes, there are corruption, but fortunately it's not impacting us with the tight uh, regulations we have placed. You have already seen the, um, the process about cross-checking and the other stuff. Um, one of the risks is where one of the risks we had was where some of the schools were being converted to the government schools um, with the help of uh, the teachers and they were trying to do with without the knowledge of the committee as soon as we became aware of that uh, we had organized meeting with the high ups in the education department and we have put a complete stop on that so without our permission none of these schools can be converted into government schools and to let you know as well because of our process and our systems this school is performing all our schools are actually performing much better than the government schools and the parents of the children, they, uh, one of the things they don't get by coming to our school is with government schools, they receive 200 taka per month. 
with our schools, uh, they don't receive that. However, they know that the quality of education is much better and that, that's how we also do well. Uh, our students actually do well in the high schools. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but um, we have uh, we are tackling with corruption and um, from our uh, side with processes and systems, uh, we are actually on top of everything. Thank you. To be, to be honest, uh, I can just add to that, to what Bohan has said, that, you know, a little bit like the tides of Bangladesh, corruption is continual tide, you know, and you have to fight it on a daily basis. It doesn't go away just because you defeat it once. It keeps coming back. Um, and so when Bohan gave that presentation, yes, it was, you know, a little bit finicky and, and boring if, if what you want to see is pictures of kids, but the reality is that structure um, but that structure is what stops corruption from, it's the rust, rust fighter in, in, in within uh, co-ed, within Fred Hyde schools. That's what keeps the rust of corruption out by having cross checking continually, continually monitoring and in particular, um, opening up communication between Bola Island and Dhaka, between uh, Bola Island and Australia, the continual visits by people like Paddy and Bohan and myself, um, the fact that we bring our own interpreters along rather than use someone else's. And you know, the other thing that's probably for some of you who are new to COVID that's, that probably I need to emphasize is a lot of what we do, we pay for ourselves. So the, one of the reasons why this charity is so extremely lean is that the expensive costs, which generally relate to white skin, you know, NGOs in Bangladesh are very expensive operations because they're run by white people who demand big money. Um, but, but, you know, the white people that you see going there, and I'll include um, Bohan as an um, honorary white person, just for the purposes of the point, um, we pay our own expenses, and they're the big expenses. Everybody else gets paid at local level. Um, but, yeah, just, just as a general answer, and I think Tony's gone off screen now. Um, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's a continual battle. Okay, T uh, Tony, uh, uh, Olive, I could add something there. Oh, was Tony there? Uh, just the last uh, five schools we've actually opened, we didn't get land donated. We actually built them in uh, communities, uh, colonies that were already established by the government, but there was no schools. Uh, and by colony, I mean like a large um, housing commission estate where landless and homeless people can apply and uh, for a house and get one allocated. Uh, so uh, we built, so the land already owns, the government, so we don't have any of that, um, you know, somebody donating land and wants, uh, um, you know, favours for that. Um, in fact, the last two schools at uh, uh, one of those uh, colonies you've seen there in the early photos where there was a lot of houses, we actually were given permission by the government and, and along with the community people uh, to use their, um, uh, like, community meeting place for a school. So all we needed to do there was provide staff and, uh, and obviously school furniture, uh, which obviously saved a great expense and uh, uh, um, has been extensive. Now we may, in those community uh, buildings, they may become uh, too small as the school develops, but uh, at the moment, uh, things are working well. Yeah, look, uh we showed those aerial shots that were taken by a, a, a visiting school uh, from Beacon Hills, I think, uh, or St. Leonard's actually. Uh, they took a drone with them the last time they visited and took those, those um, uh, screenshots of the, of the colonies that, that Patty's talking about. And you'll have seen, if you caught it, those two pictures of those destroyed buildings. Those destroyed buildings were brand new. And the reason they were destroyed, a little bit of a wind came along and destroyed them, partly because they're vulnerable, partly because they're built in the firing line of the Bay of Bengal, but also partly because the contractor was corrupt. Um, Paddy schools don't blow over, even in a cyclone, but that, those schools and those buildings um, blew over in the first storm that came. Um, so, you know, fighting corruption is partly about quality, you know, ensuring quality. Uh, and that includes what Bohan referred to with recruitment. Because we interviewed, because there's no money changing hands, we can pick the best candidates for the schools as teachers, rather than the person who can afford to pay for a job. 
um, which is what commonly does happen, unfortunately. Yes, it does. And I lost my internet connection, but I got it back. So <laughs> I'm back on the Zoom conference here. And it's a wonderful thing, this technology. Um, the next question um, is, Fred Hyde schools are doing great work in the island. Um, do you have any plans for technical education for graduate students? Perhaps Olav, perhaps um, you have some thoughts in that area? Look, um, we've, had, we've had donors come to us specifically um, offering to try to build a, te a technical school or even a high school. Um, and, you know, they're offering pretty good money. Um, but, you know, running these operations relative to running primary schools are phenomenally expensive because unless you build a technical school or a high school at every one of our um, primary schools, it's a problem. And just very briefly, the reason it's a problem is because you would have seen from the videos you saw tonight how awfully difficult it is to get around in the island. So, you know, to travel four kilometres or five kilometres or to walk two kilometres to school like those little girls were doing is a big slog. It's a literal slog. So there's no commuting. There's no easy commute to high school or to a central um, you've got to build the schools where the people are. So we'd have to build 50 odd technical schools or 50 odd high schools. And it just becomes too phenomenally expensive. Or we've got to build, um, um, what do you call, boarding schools. And then you've got to pay for food and accommodation for the kids. And then suddenly it becomes phenomenally expensive. So um, we have thought about um, technical school options and talked about um, one of the one of the people here tonight talked about floating schools. Uh, and, you know, we've talked about the possibility of a traveling technical school. Um, but we want to also look after, um, uh, you know, non, um, I, I, was, I was about to say girls education, but it's a bit sexist um, to say, okay, girls can't do technical. Um, but it is a pretty sexist society, I have to say, in rural Bangladesh. Um, so it is pretty traditional what jobs go to girls and what jobs go to boys. But yeah, we, we, need to, we need to think of these things because maybe just stopping at the primary school level isn't good enough. It's, it's an interesting point that Ola touched on there, which is the, the relatively sexist society over there and gender equality is a personal interest of mine, whether it's in Australia or Bangladesh. One of the interesting things at our schools is that the, on average, the girls are doing better than the boys at the minute. Not only are they doing better, they're actually remaining in school longer because we have students leaving at incredibly early state ages, some of them to enter the workforce, six, seven, eight, nine, and the girls are being better retained than the guys. Now, that's then producing a situation. As we begin to think about gender equality in Fred Hyde schools, what does that mean to us? It probably means helping the boys. It's quite a change from the way one thinks in Australia. But that's probably what we need to do to produce a more equal outcome from our schools. And it's certainly an area which, which merits some thought uh, and some real focus to try to find a way to take all the students forward in our schools so they get as far as possible in the education system. The, uh, we got some very nice comments on the, uh, from Mustak Khan. Thank you, Mustak. Um, that, that was very, very nice of you, all your support there. Um, the, we had a simple question on the total number of schools and preschools for COVID um, and what we can do to support aside from financial contributions of course um, and that, that's often been one of the more difficult areas to balance up how we should do that. Um, who would like to make a comment on that? Uh, I can, Tony, just to, just to quickly point out that um, one of the reasons that we built the extension on the office that you saw, that second and third story, 
um, which is turning it into a bit of a skyscraper by Bolwa standards. Um, but that was partly funded um, by our Victorian school supporters because they were looking for the opportunity to bring more school visits over there. Um, so I, I think that, you know, we have as much to learn from the experience of visiting Bangladesh as the Bangladeshis have to learn from the schools that we build. Um, the trouble is COVID has just thrown a spanner in the works. So Paddy and I are really wondering when we'll next be able to go to Bangladesh. Um, at the moment, it's, as you know, impossible. Um, what else can we do? It's very difficult. Bangladesh has very good protectionist policies. So it stops you from exporting, for example, secondhand clothes or secondhand textbooks or secondhand anything to them, uh, or even brand new. Um, there are protections in place because they want to support, um, you know, domestic production, domestic um, uh, manufacturing, which, um, you know, is very admirable and uh, something that I think all countries are starting to think about in the COVID era is supporting domestic production. Um, so it's a little bit hard to, unless you volunteer for the committee or volunteer to go over there to do some of the things we do do, um, it's hard to answer that. But I, I, I could say that, you know, what, what do we do do over there tends to be fairly unglamorous. Um, it tends to be administrative, you know, personnel work, HR, um, you know, it's uh, not particularly glamorous work, but it is work that, that does help, you know, the kids get their education. I think I'll have, um, I would just quickly add on, on that if possible. Um, I mean, someone can be a voice of co of Fred Height schools and obviously they can help uh, you know this organization reach to many more people uh, which may help us you know delivering more work and the needed work that we do over there mm. uh, and the truth is you know this is a voluntary committee um, we we do ask ourselves how much more can we take you know i mean how many more schools can we build? Um, you know, we're, we're thinking about building a small medical clinic. Um, and we've had lots of doctor support from Bangladesh from people prepared to donate time and, and other resources. But um, it's a very big charity already. It's like 180 staff. In Bangladeshi terms, that's a big charity. But it's in fact, in Australian terms, a very small charity. Our total budget is, you know, somewhere around the $400,000 a year, which is is actual chicken feed in terms of Australian charities. Um, but that's partly because there's a lot of volunteers doing a lot of scrambling around um, on tight budgets. Um, so it does make, we, we got to think about that. So there isn't always, we're always welcome to, to join us uh, either as you know, general support or committee um, uh, or anything else that you can think of. Um, mm. You know, that's what makes the organisation run. That's right. Uh, we have one question here for Bohan, I think. Just a concern about whether um, culture, the local culture stifles the influence that we're trying to bring through education. Does the culture stifle it or support it? But how do you see that working, Bohan? I think the local culture is very much supportive of the work that the Fred Hyde School does. And for those of you who don't know the story, how Fred started building schools, I'm not sure if many of you have heard that. Fred went to manage an orphanage and he found out that a small boy, he drank poison thinking that it was actually medicine. That actually what prompted Fred to understand that education is what's needed in this poorest of the poor area. And that's when he started building school. Fred Hyde schools have a very good name in char fashion and the people are really grateful. And to give you some more insights, we actually also work with, um, um, we try to prevent uh, the marriage of underage girls through engaging the mothers of our students at our schools. We have also um, started to 
um, pass on those sort of messages through the monthly meetings that the moms actually have and uh, try to explain. Sometimes the situation over there is very complex. It's extremely complex and unless you are there, it's very hard to understand. Poverty is a big thing. But anyway, we are trying to give the message that, you know, education is something that might bring them hope and they actually understand that. So um, again, the culture is very much in favor of us and they are really appreciative um, of what's done by the Fred Hyde schools. And Tony, if you wish, you can also mention that donation for the bushfire victims that happened as a gesture of gratitude. Yes, yeah, that was an amazing event. Um, th th this happened just uh, on the year, you remember the year of the terrible bushfires in, uh, in Victoria, um, where the, yeah, we had whole little villages or little towns destroyed. Um, a few months later, Fred Hyde was holding a meeting on Bowler Island with the teachers, and one of the teachers, one of the uh, braver ones, got up and, and, and said, and asked a question about whether they would be getting a pay rise. And Fred got up and he said, well, we've just had in Australia bushfires. We have had towns destroyed. We've had livelihoods destroyed. We're really concerned that Australians will donate to that this year and not donate to us. And so, sorry, this year there is no increase. And nothing more was said at the time. And Fred went on as normal. And a couple of days later, he began to hear that something was happening at the schools. He checked it out. They were organizing a whip round a, 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 to, for donations for the victims in Australia. They ended up raising over $700 for uh, mostly in donations of less than five cents, but everyone was putting in. Um, and it turned into quite an event for us because we got, it was the only time we've had the Australian High Commissioner down on Bowler Island. And the local people hadn't seen anything like it because when you get a High Commissioner down, you get guards with guns and dark glasses and, and they'd actually never seen anything like it, nor had we. Um, it was a peaceful rural area. But it was wonderful to have that support. And it really spoke a lot to us about what the local people are like and the, and the values they have and the value they place on what we do and, and, and what, what you support at the end of the line and everyone who's here. So, so yes, so I think we are reaching about the end of the Zoom conference. We've gone a little over time, but thank you guys. Thank you for all being here. Thank you to no, all of the speakers. We really appreciate uh, Olaf, Paddy, Gorhan, all the time you put in. Olaf spent ages putting together videos for this. So, um, so thank you very much. We really appreciate your support. If you want to ring any of this afterwards, we're more than happy to take your calls. And um, thank you for being along. And thank you for caring. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Great job, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Olaf and Tony and Patty and everyone. Great. Very, very impressive. Very impressive. Great to Hello see to you, Marion. Great. <laughs> Good to see you all again. Good to see you, Marion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bohan. Thank you, Thank you Olaf. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, team. Great presentation. Yeah. Thanks, Liam. Yeah. The videos are great, Olaf. I, I'm hoping that I've um, recorded it. Um, 
I'm pretty sure I have. You're still recording now, actually. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Maybe I should press stop. Um, <laughs> yeah.